And Pankaj is an economics professor at Boston University and has been collecting coins for a long, long time since he was a boy. He published his first numismatic article in 1998 and has written over 50 more articles since, mostly on ancient Indian coins. He's also the um, publisher of the well-known website coinindia.com, which I'm sure we've all used at some stage. Um, Pankaj was um, the North American Regional Secretary of the ONS um, from 2014 to 2021. And then in January of um, last year, he um, went upstairs and now serves as the ONS Secretary General. And he's the first Secretary General to be based outside the UK. So another glass ceiling there. This is a follow on to a paper, the paper I gave at the 50th anniversary conference back last summer. I've been looking for the last several years at measurable aspects of the coinage so that we can actually do statistics on, on things. And so for a while I was working on weights and now I'm working on the gold content. And the idea is to get a large enough sample that we can actually do meaningful statistics. So that's what, what, what the general uh, program is. And so I'm looking at Gupta gold coins uh, for those who are not familiar, the Gupta Empire roughly was much of northern India uh, from around the middle of the 3rd century to the middle of the 6th century. It was a very, very major dynasty. Many people in India consider it the golden age of ancient India. Certainly there was a tremendous cultural flowering at the time uh, in mathematics, in art, literature, there were all kinds of great things happening in India at the time. Um, uh, so I've given you uh, a quick uh, summary of the main kings. So the main kings are starting with Chandragupta I to Skandagupta. So that's a period of 150 years. And then the minor kings are another 50 plus years after that. Um, all the kings issued gold coins, and this is just a sample of uh, the kinds of coins they were making. Those of you who are familiar with Kushan coins will see the coin on the top left is a cop is basically an imitation of a Kushan coin. It's been slightly Indianized already, uh, but you can see the outlines basically of the Kushan design. And then they branched out and started doing all kinds of other designs, uh, unlike the Kushans, which, which stayed very sort of uh, rigid in their, in their style and design. And of all the different coins, there are four major types, and they're going to feature in, in something I'll do a little bit later. There was the so-called archer type, which every single king in the Gupta series issued. That was the main type, although in Samudra Gupta's time, uh, his main type was the standard or scepter type. He just issued a, f a you know, very few archer types. Uh, but after him, the archer type became the standard Gupta coin. Uh, we could argue about that for Kumara Gupta because there seemed to be uh, the horseman type may have superseded the archer type in Kumara Gupta's time. But the archer, the horseman, the lion slayer, and the so-called chatra type. The, word chatra means umbrella, and we can't really see it very clearly, but this line here, this guy here, this what looks like a dwarf, is actually an attendant who's holding, uh, and, and you can see this vertical kind of pole, and above it is an umbrella, and the umbrella was considered the symbol of royalty, because uh, a king needs to be protected from the hot sun, I assume. And, and we'll be talking a little bit about these four types. So what I've been doing is XRF analysis. And uh, you know I've talked about this before, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time, but I feel that the XRF studies overestimate the gold content a little bit. Uh, and uh, th this graph shows uh, comparisons. This is for Kushan coins, but three different studies where the red are XRF results that, that I got and then the blue are uh, proton activation uh, analysis numbers that uh, Maurice Blit uh, Marquand, now I'm getting her name kind of mixed up, um, in Paris 
uh, using very, very uh, top quality equipment. So hers are probably quite uh, accurate. And then these are Métis specific gravity results that, that are, uh, seem to be underestimates. So there's a slight overestimation in the XRF, but it, this doesn't matter for my purposes where I'm doing relatives. So I'm seeing what's happening in the trend. Um, so I've done uh, XRF on 169 coins. Uh, Sanjeev Kumar, who published a book on Gupta coins recently, uh, published data on 194 coins. So that gives us a total of 363. Uh, and it includes all kings except uh, this one minor king in the, in the late period, Venya Gupta. And one thing I spent a lot of time doing was to show that my data and Sanjeev's is perfectly compatible. So we get very similar results. So the fact that we're doing it in two different places using two different machines uh, can be overlooked with the results of, of virtually identical. And you know, I did proper statistics and, and showed that they're pretty much the same. And so we have this combined sample. And, and I, I should say that having this larger sample is really, really good because a lot of my results, I tried using just my coins and the results turn out to be statistically insignificant. Then I tried using Sanjeev's coins and the results turn out to be statistically insignificant. But when I put the two together, the results are statistically significant. So having the larger sample really makes a difference. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm happy, I'm happy to have done that and hopefully we can get more, but I don't have access to, to more coins myself, so. So this just gives you a quick scatter diagram of the percentage gold content for each coin in the sample, the 363 coins. And what we can see is that there's a trend. Uh, so within each king, they are, these are more or less random. But of course, the kings are arranged chronologically. So we can see that there's a downward trend, downward long-term trend in the percentage of gold content. Uh, and we are seeing that the dispersion, especially towards the end, is getting very wide. So the quality control is really kind of weakening uh, towards the end of the, of the period. Um, now, against this falling gold percentage, we have this rather mysterious thing about Gupta coins, which is that the weights go up over time. And this is a really unusual thing because almost every series you look at, the weights tend to decline over time. But in Gupta coins, the, the weights actually go up over time. And so it, one of the questions I started out wanting to answer was, why do the weights go up? And I wondered if it was a, a way for the, for the Gupta kings to hide the fact that they were depreciating the currency. So that was a kind of a hypothesis I had in the back of my mind. And so I naturally was you know, interested in what's happening to the actual gold content of the coins. So if we look at the actual gold content, at a quick glance, it looks roughly constant. The dispersion is increasing, but at a quick glance, it looks roughly constant over time. And actually Sanjeev Kumar, when he published his data, said, we can see it's roughly constant. But, uh, and if we look at individual, you know, by look at averages for individual kings, we actually see that it's not quite so straightforward. We, th there's, a, there's a little bit of a rise from Samudragupta to Chandragupta the second, then there seems to be a decline, then there seems to be a rise. And at this point, oh, this, this actually data is, is incorrect. I've actually tossed out one coin. I've concluded it's a fake. And so this is actually much more of a straight line here. I apologize for that. Um, but we can't say that much about the late kings anyway, because the number of coins we have is too small. But if we look at the principal kings from Samudragupta to Skandagupta, that's that first 150 years I talked about. We see that it looks roughly constant, but when you do statistics, these are, these are statistically significant differences. So uh, I'm especially interested in the fact that from Chandragupta II to Chandragupta III, 
this period, there's a statistically significant decline in the actual amount of gold. When I say actual amount of gold, what I'm doing is for each coin, I'm taking the percentage of gold, I'm taking the weight, and then I'm calculating the actual amount of gold in that coin. And I've done that for all of the 363 coins in the sample. So I'm looking at the actual gold content and then averaging for the kings. And so there seems to be a decline. And as I said, that's statistically significant. Um, and happening here. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't need to bore you with the, you know, the specifics of the numbers. Here, the, you know, here are the t-test results. In fact, for those of you who are quantitatively inclined, you can see that you know it, it, the one-tail test, the the significance is incredible between Chandragupta II and Kumaragupta, uh, not quite as dramatic, but still at three percent, three point six percent. Um, so th these are very significant results. Um, and so there's clearly a declining portion, declining gold content between those three kings. And maybe that's telling us something about what's happening in the Gupta economy at the time. We know that, that in Kumar Gupta's reign, they started facing uh, external uh, conflict because Skanda Gupta starts talking about battling the Pushyamitras and the Mlechas and the Huns eventually. So something was going on, and certainly Chandragupta III was sort of a low point. And then Skandagupta actually reports in his inscriptions how he restored the fortunes of the dynasty and, and, and uh, prevented the uh, tottering of the dynasty from happening and so on. So, uh, so we're getting some reflection of that in, the, in, in this data. Uh, now, Joe had asked about the types. So I'm, I apologize that the colors are not really coming out, but I just wanted to illustrate that if we look at individual types, we get a lot of dispersion within a king. So this is within Samudra Gupta. If we look at the average percentage gold in the different types, we see there's a lot of variation. Um, and and I, I'm actually gonna zoom in on the principal kings. And you can see, so for example, Samudra Gupta, it varies from about 83% to 95%. Uh, Kumara Gupta, we see it varies from about 72% to 88%. So there's tremendous variation across types. And which is rather really strange because as far as we know, these dinars traded one for one. There was no in all the inscriptions we have, there's only information that, okay, for this amount of land, so many dinars were paid. Or for this temple to be, you know, to be maintained, so many dinars were donated. It's never specified what kind of dinars, which king, which type, none of that information is specified. So it seems like these must have traded one for one. And in hordes, they are found all collected together. You know, there, there doesn't seem to be a separation. So th this is another mystery that needs resolution. Um, you know, I, I just had these in case people ask specific questions, but, you know, in terms of the variation in the um, percentage. And then, um, and th this is, so, so one thing we observe is that, for example, those, and, and again, I'll look at the principal kings. So within types, there's that declining trend. So, so remember those four types that I showed you earlier on that did cross ki various kings. So the lion slayer, the chatra, the horseman, and the archer. So I've I've um, I've illustrated those four types, and you can see that with those three kings, that same decline is happening. It, it looks like four points because I've divided Chandragupta into the ones with throne reverse and the ones with lotus reverse, because that gives us a chronological separation. And so even within Chandragupta's reign, there was a declining trend uh, as, as far as we can tell. And then if we look at the amount of gold, this was gold percentage. If we look at amount, the amount of gold, we again see that tremendous variation and we see 
we see the declining trend. So the, so the actual gold content is declining in that, in that time period. So the, so the point I'm making is that this declining trend we are seeing is not an artifact of a different mix of types being produced because within the types also there was a declining trend. And you know, I, I don't, I don't have any dramatic conclusions to offer you today. I'm just, you know, we, we're looking at this data and learning stuff about the coins and maybe there are more questions than that are being thrown up. I looked at silver and copper. Obviously as gold is declining, the other two elements, the other two principal elements will be increasing. And we see that. And I wanted to compare the copper to silver ratio that we see in our in these Gupta coins to the data that uh, has been found. Let Le, Le Khan is the person who I was named trying to name earlier. Uh, she found this um, two to one ratio or zero point five ratio copper to silver in Kushan coins. In Gupta coins, I find a copper to silver ratio of about 0.36 on average. And what's interesting about that is that it implies a ratio of 26 copper to 73, 26 and a half to 73 and a half copper to silver, which is very close to this uh, so-called eutectic ratio of 28 to 72 at which the melting point of the alloy is at a minimum. So what it suggests to me is that what was happening was that they were taking a sort of a, a gold source and were adding this copper silver alloy to it. And the copper silver alloy that they were adding was kind of optimized to this eutectic ratio, which makes it easier to handle it since it's melting, uh, uh, you know, the melting point is at, at a minimum. Um, which suggests that these met me the metallurgy was quite sophisticated. Um, uh, if, if we look at individual kings, here's the, the, the blue line is the eutectic ratio. And these are the individual kings from Samudra Gupta to Skanda Gupta. Uh, and the, uh, you know, they, they seem to be kind of hovering around that that even within kings to that eutectic ratio. So if you have suggestions on of things we can do with this stuff, I'm all ears and would welcome them. Thank you.